When it says that this is the household of God, first of all, it reveals that there is only one Lord, one master. There is only one head to the church, to that local church. And it is Jesus Christ. It's his house and his rules. Now, I'm somewhat hospitable. I like having people over if they can bear with my wild family and all the wild things we do. Love to have people over. Try to be extremely polite. But if you walk into my house and you start directing my wife and you start ordering my children and you start moving things around, listen very carefully. There is a sense in which I will, in the old fashioned use of the term, I will despise you. I will say to you, who do you think that you are? Let me give you an example. Several years ago, there was a very wealthy, wealthy business person owned a huge media corporation. And this person one day heard a preacher, a Christian preacher, or so he identified with Christianity, say that God was a jealous God. And because of that, this very wealthy and, and prosperous and brilliant business person decided that, no, I do not want the God of Christianity at all. If he's God, how can he be reduced so low as to be jealous? How could he be so petty? This person doesn't realize what they're saying. Now, this person that I'm describing is brilliant, has built an empire and has worked very, very, very hard. Now imagine that one day, a brand new employee, it's his first day at work, he walks into the central office and all of a sudden, he takes over. And this business magnate walks out of the office and goes, who, who are you? You didn't build this. You, you weren't even here when I started. This is your first day. How dare you be so audacious, arrogant, that you would come in here and think that you could run this company by your rules. That's exactly what's happened. That's exactly what's happening when pastors and ministers of Christ are not running the church according to sola scriptura, what is written, but according to their own clever plans or the clever plans of some successful man in their denomination who happened to build a church by not doing the word of God. We don't need to hear from clever men. We need to hear from the inspired scriptures. to the theme for this evening's session, which is the authority and the power of God's Word. In my previous session, I pointed out to you that the two different, uh, there are two different ways in which the title, the Word of God, is applied. It's applied to the Bible and it's applied to Jesus Christ. Each of them is called the Word of God. And this brings out the fact that there is a complete identity between Jesus and the Bible. The Bible is God's written word. Jesus is God's personal word. And if we really want to be rightly related to Jesus, we have to be rightly related to the Bible. We cannot be rightly related to Jesus, but wrongly related to the Bible. So this, this evening, I want to deal with this theme which is obviously of great importance, the authority and the power of God's Word. To begin with the issue of authority, if you stop and consider it, you realize that the word authority comes directly from the word author. In other words, the authority of any work is the authority of the author. It's the author who gives authority to whatever he produces. So we need to know 
Who is the author of the Bible? Who is the author of Scripture? And the Bible clearly answers this question. In 2 Timothy 3, verse 16, it says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So if you want to be complete and thoroughly equipped for every good work, the source of it all is Scripture. And Paul says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. The, the Greek word is God-breathed. In other words, the authority behind all Scripture is the authority of the Holy Spirit. He is ultimately the author. He used many different channels and many different instruments, but behind them all is the authority of the Holy Spirit, who is God himself. So when we confront the Scripture, we confront the authority of God himself. Now it says, all Scripture is inspired, not some. Some people would weed out the passages they consider inspired from those they don't consider really authoritative. But that is not in line with Scripture, because the Holy Spirit himself says, all Scripture is inspired by God, and all Scripture is profitable. In other words, there's no books that you can leave out and say they're not important. And he says, these things I have spoken to you while being present with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, that's the title of the Holy Spirit, the Helper, sometimes he's called the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. So the authority behind the writings of the apostles is the authority of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said he'll do two things. Whatever I didn't teach you, he will teach you. And whatever I said but you might have forgotten, he will bring to your remembrance. And let me point out to you, that's another extremely important mark of the Holy Spirit. He always glorifies Jesus. And if you ever are confronted by spiritual manifestations that do not glorify Jesus, that give glory to a man or to some other, in some other direction, you can be sure that it's not the Holy Spirit. Because the supreme ministry of the Holy Spirit is to reveal and to glorify Jesus. That's one good way of testing the spirits. The Bible says we are to test the spirits. And you can test if a thing is from the Holy Spirit. One sure test is it will glorify Jesus. If it doesn't, it may sound very good, it may sound very spiritual, but it isn't from the Holy Spirit because he will not glorify anyone but Jesus. And the moment human personalities begin to take glory to themselves, the Holy Spirit says, sorry, but I have to leave. You can carry on, but I won't be here. And that's how many, many ministries have gone astray in living memory. My living memory, which extends a lot further than some of yours. I could not count the number of ministries that have ended in ruin because men took the glory which the Holy Spirit will only give to Jesus. And I want to tell you, I'm very, very conscious of that myself. I'm continually examining myself. Am I giving the glory to Jesus? Or am I trying to persuade people that Derek Prince is someone important? Derek Prince is a sinner saved by the grace of God. Now, let's go on to a really interesting and important theme, which is the nature of God's Word. For the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. You notice it's compared again to the sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It's not just black marks on white paper. It's not just sounds that come from a preacher's mouth. It's alive. It's living. And wherever it comes, it brings life. The Word of God is alive, 
and powerful. It's more powerful than all the lies with which Satan has filled the world. The Word of God is the ultimate answer. But the Bible reveals that man is a triune being, spirit, soul, and body. A triune being created in the likeness of a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But the only way we can learn to distinguish between the soul and the spirit is by the Word of God. It's the only instrument that's sharp enough to penetrate and separate what is soulish from what is spiritual. You find that the soulish, in many ways, is in opposition to the spiritual. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul says, the soulish man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are spiritually discerned. And where no psychiatrist probing can penetrate, it's the only thing that takes us right into the very depths of human personality. And then it says, it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. To discern means to analyze, to, to see into the very nature of something. And somebody said years ago when I was a young believer, and it's always stuck with me, remember when you are reading your Bible, your Bible is also reading you. It's a two-way transaction. I, they were so vivid to me because I started to read the Bible simply as a professional philosopher, treating it as a work of God. But as I went on reading, and I found it very dreary, and only my determination that no book would ever defeat me kept me reading, I began to feel quite different about myself. I thought up to that time I already had the answer to everything. Philosophy could provide a solution to everything. But as I went on reading the Bible, I became less and less self-confident. I couldn't understand what was happening to me. I thought I was getting old before my time, although I wasn't even 25 at the time. I didn't realize <laughs> while I was reading the Bible, the Bible was reading me. And at the end, I felt like Belshazzar at his feast when the writing appeared on the wall. You've been weighed in the balances and found wanting. And my self-conceit, my pride, my arrogance, my intellectual assurance all began to wilt before the Scripture. And yet I didn't believe it at the time, but it was still doing its work. So bear that in mind. When you read your Bible, your Bible is also reading you. Paul is writing to the believers in Thessalonica who had responded in a wonderful way to the message of the Gospel. And he says, For this reason we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. You understand that what the Bible will do in you depends in part on how you receive it. It's a word of man, I'm sorry, it's a word of man. But if you receive it as the word of God, it works effectively in you. And when you read your Bible, take time from now and then to say to the Lord, I believe this is your word. I receive it as your word. Let it work in me everything you've sent it to do in every area of my being. In 2 Peter chapter 1, one of the most remarkable statements, I think, anywhere in Scripture, His divine power, that's God's divine power, has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who has called us to glory and virtue. That's an amazing statement. It says God's divine, omnipotent power has already given to us everything we're ever going to need. And you might respond, well, God, I don't seem to have it. Where is it? And the next verse tells you, by which has been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So how has God given to us all things that we need for life and godliness? Where are they? They're in the promises. And I like this little sentence that I've coined, the provision is in the promises. 